Greetings, peace, family. This is Kyle Dixon here for another episode of the Grand Rising Collective Podcast. We wish you the best. We hope that you have been doing well. And if you're not familiar with that platform of this podcast, the Grand Rise Collective is a space where we invite people from the community all over the Americas and and globally to come here to get some advice, insight, and information about what's going on in the world and just certain topics that we bring up. So just to give you a short uh, synopsis of what we do, uh, I'm Kyle Dixon, co-host, also with my other co-host, Kyde Bentley. Uh, I've been educated for 20 plus years, entrepreneur for 15 plus years, and we are we have chosen to come together to bring you this type of uh, platform that should empower you, engage you, inform you, and inspire you. So we chose the term Grand Rising Collective because it's a term of endearment, like good morning, grand rising, you rise to the occasion, you rise to meet your obstacles and challenges, and always do it at your best, grand, do it at your best, do be excellent, do excellence, uh, exemplify excellence, and that's what we're about here on this platform. So without further ado, I'd like to swing it to my co-host, Kyde Bentley. You got the, you got the mic, my brother. Thank you very much, my brother. Appreciate you always. So let me do real quick my introduction because y'all know I could be long-winded. So let me try and <laughs> not be long-winded. Um, my name is Kyle Bentley. I'm the president and founder of an organization called Four T's, which stands for Teaching Teens to Think. The reason why I've joined uh, the Grand Rising Collective with my co-host and partner Cal Dixon is to be able to cascade that information to a larger audience. My organization targets the demographic of 16 to 24 year olds, whereas the Grand Rising Collective uh, targets the community that exists of parents, that consists of uh, organizational leaders, things of that nature. So that way our conversations like this aren't in a bubble, but more so to the community at large to help us uplift the world. Well, it's not a community, which is really a neighborhood, which we can mm -hmm. form in the community in order to leverage the playing field. So that's the reason why I'm honored to be a part of the Grand Rising Collective. I'm glad to be here. And I think it's important that you know who's speaking to you as well as who you're listening to. So without any further delay, you know how I do. Kyle brought another heavy hit. I mean, I got to keep up with this cat. No. Uh, <laughs> we, have, we have Juliana here, and she's going to introduce herself, let us know a little about herself, and then we're going to dive right into this conversation, which I'm excited uh, to really learn uh, mm -hmm. about. Juliana, please introduce yourself. Hello. Good, after good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, I am currently a full professor at Savannah State University, and um, it has been just a pleasure to be serving uh, historically black colleges for over 10 years, over 10, 13 years, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm originally from Brazil. I was born and raised in Rio. And so um, it's just a, a joy to be able to share my experiences with you all and, and they just share my, my, my research and, and, and how I perceive race relations in Brazil as well as here in the US. Thank you for having me, Kyle. You know, it's a pleasure to see you, my brother. Yes. yes. Thank you also. Um, yes. Kayo, Kayoli. Kayo, yeah, no. Kayo, it's a pleasure. Kayo, 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 yeah. yeah, so it's just a. Uh, <laughs> I just, heard it all. Just, I heard it all. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and Kyle, you know, we, we've been uh, family friends for, for many years. It's just yes. a, a pleasure and a joy to be on his podcast. Indeed, and a pleasure to have you, Juliana. Dr. Tremell, my, you know, um, yeah, family, this is a, a friend uh, from the other side of, of, of the world, uh, but down below, you know, uh, but in a reference of, you know, having that relationship with Juliana uh, through my older brother, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to be able to say like that's family. So I had to bring her on here because uh, she's not only just a friend, but she's a professional and uh, excellent in what she does in her field. So uh, so let's just jump right into it. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready, family. I'm ready. So 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 Dr. Tremel, I'm gonna call you Dr. Tremel because that's that respect, you know. Um, what was it like as far as how you got here to, to the Americas? 
what was the point, the purpose, and how you begin to like develop your skill set as far as going into your profession as a, as a PhD? Yeah. I grew up as a black young girl in Brazil, and I never imagined to travel abroad. You know, I had, I knew people, I knew friends who had gone to Disney World, but coming from a working family, um, thinking about traveling abroad was never um, a dream of mine because of more because I couldn't afford. Uh, but I always had the interest to learn a second language because you now from Brazil, we, we speak Portuguese. And so when I was maybe 12 or 13 years old, I developed this desire to just learn English. And so after school, I'll go to learn a second language. And I was doing that for maybe five, five years. And so when I was 17 years old, uh, there was an opportunity to serve as volunteers for missionaries going down to Brazil. And so I did that for a couple of weeks. And then uh, in uh, July of 2006, uh, 1996, I'm sorry, 1996, uh, there was a World Methodist Conference taking place in Rio. And so I volunteered to be a, a, a translator for that conference. And when I was there, Reverend Tristana Major Archibald, a minister from Nashville, Tennessee, where you're from, Kyle, and uh, Dr. David Backley, the president of Rust College, my undergrad in Mississippi, they were both impressed because I was the only Afro-Brazilian bilingual in the whole group of volunteers. There were some mm -hmm. others, but they were, you know, light skin or, and I was the only dark skin sister really speaking two languages. So they were like, no, what's going on with her? So they approached <laughs> me and they started to ask questions about me. And luckily I've always been a very smart, you know, student. I was like to, you know, because, Growing up as a black kid, that's what you have. That's that's your way out is mm. to be smart. So, uh, you know, you can't be pretty when you're black. You can't be on TV. You can't be anything. But there's one thing that I could control. That's, you know, it was being uh, smart. And so I always use, you know, intelligence as a way to be somebody. This is me growing up in Brazil. And so they were very impressed because my, my grades were all, you know, high and and so they offered me a scholarship to come to Russ College um, uh, as a traditional freshman. I was like, oh no, you, you don't know my family. You don't know, I don't have any money. And they said, you have a full scholarship, just come. Come in the spring, in, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the spring, which was January. And I said, no, I need a whole year to save money for the plane ticket. We don't have any money, you know, I need a whole year to save the money. So the president of the first college said, fine, we will welcome you in August of the following year, which was 1996. And uh, so I came as a freshman in 97. In 97, I came as a freshman at Trust College. And, and, so, and then uh, that's when my journey, you know, began. Yeah. Wow. 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 Because I just know, like, I never knew the full story. Like, I know we talked when you initially got into the yeah. state and came to Rust and everything. But, you know, like, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that term too, uh, Dr. Tremel, like Afro-Brazilian, because a lot of times I didn't realize until much later that Brazil has one of the highest concentrations of African people outside of Africa in comparison to America. So that's the largest. It's only Nigeria. Only Nigeria, not even another country in the continent of Africa has more people of color than Brazil. Brazil is the sec has the second largest population. And Brazil was the last, Brazil was the country that received the most enslaved Africans during mm -hmm. slavery. And mm -hmm. it was the last country to abolish slavery. So we have a lot of history to tell uh, when it comes to, you know, the experience of the diaspora, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, so coming here, coming to the U.S. was funny because all this information, I could not see through the lenses of the Brazilian culture. It was necessary for me to experience the African-American experience and understand what that meant and what that means. So I could then look at Brazil and start to dig into, you know, what it, what it meant to be an Afro-Brazilian. Uh, because none of that, and your family was very influential, even helped to mold my understanding of of blackness and what it means to be part of this africa diaspora because in brazil they really teach you how to be brazilian that was part of the whole strategy was to make racism 
uh, in, in existing in Brazil, which is a mess. But Brazil always boosts the reputation of being free of racial discrimination. And it was all planned. Uh, so the, the, the racism in Brazil is more systemic. You know, contrary to uh, Jim Crow and contrary to how um, race relations were uh, treated in the US, in Brazil, Brazil came as like a model for not only the American history, but for the world. It's, it's as if Brazil served as if we knew, we figured things out, how to deal with race relations. And I can dig more, maybe in another question you might have, but, but growing up in that type of culture made me totally unaware of the fact that, yes, I'm Brazilian, but I'm Afro-Brazilian. It made me totally unaware that, you know, of the implications of being kidnapped from Africa to be enslaved in Brazil and be part of that culture, you know, um, and, and how, you know, the Portuguese, you know, treated, you know, people of African descent. Yeah, it was a whole, it's a whole, it's a whole day we can't spend just talking about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Okay. Do me off with that, doctor. <laughs> doctor <Chimel. laughs> Um. Wow. Okay. Wow. I'm trying to frame this question. Um. So basically, for clarity, for clarity purposes, you mean to tell me Brazil kind of perfected what the United States was trying to perfect in regards to systemic racism mm -hmm. in order to try and extract our culture and our background to actually have us feel like we had no background. That's exactly. Think, think about it. You know, look at how, look at South Africa, look at the U.S., and look at Brazil. So, you went to the Jim Crow. So the world was like, okay, they're doing something crazy there. I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing something. They legalize discrimination, right? We can't discriminate, and and, and we legal we can legally discriminate whites here, blacks here. You look at South Africa, we had the apartheid. Brazil, in 1930, when we were reading The Miseducation of the Negro, the same year, another book was being published in Brazil that was celebrating this Brazilian identity. So when you look at Brazil as a culture, there was this, this, this notion that, you know, we don't have this Afro-Brazilian thing or, or this, we all Brazilians, right? We are all mm -hmm. Brazilians. And the idea was because, see, when Portuguese went down to Brazil to colonize, which was different from the U.S., right? When the Europeans came to the U.S. with more for a new world, right? Let's make this this, this new world. Right. Let's kidnap African uh, Africans to build the country. But we're gonna really populate the U.S. as a new experience. That was not the case in Brazil. Portuguese went down to Brazil to colonize Brazil for the sugar cane and for coffee and for all those, you know, for, for, for basically the agriculture to shift back to Europe. And so, and so mainly men went down to Brazil. So they started to rape, you know, African mm. women. And so the kids were lighter. That's when it started colorism in Brazil. And so by the time the we get emancipation, you know, after slavery was abolished, they realized that the lighter skinned Brazilians had a better chance, right? Oh, okay, look at that, look at that, you know, the dark skin color with maybe some fair hair, you know, curly hair or what have you. They started to realize that miscegenation was a way out because there were too many dark people in Brazil. The number of enslaved Africans outnumber Portuguese because, again, they went down there to colonize, not to populate. There was no, the families came later, right? They just mm -hmm. came down there as, as like men working out, out of the country, you know? You're going to Brazil right. to work, exploit and work, and shift mm -hmm. things back, sure you know? And so, um, they said, so, so they had to come up with a, with a, with a, uh, with a system to develop Brazil. They couldn't ship all of us back to Africa. So they found a way in the colorism. Colorism was a way out. Enlightening the dark skin. See, my family never went through the process. My, mo my mother and my father, mom is a little lighter skin than, than my father, uh, but it was black with black. So I'm dark skin. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but the whole idea was for you to find someone lighter, was to enlighten, you know, lighten the room. That was the whole, you know, movement. And the lighter you are, better, uh, better, better opportunities you have. It was this whole idea that being dark was bad. Explain this to us this picture. This picture is called the Redemption of Come, Ken, Come. Mm-hmm. Uh, Come was one of the kids of Noah and he saw his father naked and that's how they justified that the black race was uh, cursed. The Christians, they justify racism throughout the years through the curse that is based basically on the Bible. Uh, this was shown this picture that you see right now is from 1895 it was painted by modesto broncos in the in the moment in brazil that we we were talking about the eugenics the eugenics politics the eugenics politics was pretty much the one who showed that yes we need to whiten the population because black people are less intelligent less civilized and this picture shows the grandma you see the grandma uh raising the heads to the lord uh, thanking God that her daughter, who is a mixed girl, married a white settler that came in this new idea of whitening the country, and they have a white kid, very white kid, that is in this tiny hands just blessing the grandma. If you look in the picture, and she's thanking God that the curse was broken. That picture was shown in 90, in 1895, and also in this Congress I told you that happened in London. In the week, they showed that picture. Brazil showed that picture to uh, introduce to the Europeans what was his idea to having a more civilized country after slavery. We're gonna whiten the country, and this idea is ingrained also in Black Brazilians as well. Yeah. So, so you see a country that you, you see that's the same idea we're seeing the U.S. because African Americans and I get in argument all the time. I say Brazil is worse, and they say Americans worse. We have tourism <laughs> here too, you know, and all that stuff. But I'm like, you know, at least y'all know we know here because I'm and I'm a, a U.S. citizen as well. You know, this is home too. But at least in the African American culture, you know there was a problem. So let's just deal with the problem, right? In Brazil. Colorism was part of the systemic racism. It was everybody want to be away from being dark. I think that the race has changed my life since the beginning. I'm conscious of the whole history that I carry when I identify as black. The weight of this has. My skin has never influenced or even influenced me. If you have an aspect of black, I think the doors se open much more easily. A parte ruim de ser negra é porque você é classificado pela sua cor, não pelo que você é. Quando você vai se candidatar a uma vaga de emprego, muitas das vezes você tem as mesmas qualificações ou até maiores do que aquela pessoa branca e as pessoas preferem né, escolher aquela pessoa branca. Eu e Simone, minha esposa, nós temos pais preto e branco. Mas só que ela tem características maiores da parte preta do que eu. Então, eu transito mais fácil no meio do, do povo do que ela. And this year, we see African American men, we see African American women say, I love to be, I want to be black. You know, you yeah. see American families coming together too with pride, you know, talk about the history, something mm-hmm. that I've never had, you know, growing <laughs> up as a black Brazilian. You know, in a Brazilian home, we don't talk about the things that I heard going to Kyle's house, you know, that I heard going to other, you know, friend's house, you know, we go to the cookout and you hear the stories on the cookout, you know, you go to the fish, uh, fish fry on Fridays and you can hear the stories, you know, we didn't have that. The whole idea was to remove everything African and create this Brazilian identity that mm-hmm. is a farther away from Africa that you can be. They uh, criminalized capoeira, just like how music was an instrument for enslaved Africans on the plantation in North America. Capoeira was an instrument for us and they made that uh, illegal.
remember growing up in Brazil when, when I saw people doing capoeira, you know, I would hear adults say, don't look at it, it's bad, it's evil. Wow, you know? really? So just like, you know, kumbaya and how music, you know, yeah. uh, it was a way of communication. Capoeira was a way of communication, was also a way yes. of resistance, and they took that from us. You know, so I'm, a, I'm as dark as I am, I didn't grow up listening to these stories in, in, the, in, the, in the culture that, that would make us strong, a strong unity, the way it made African Americans. And so that was one of the challenges, you know, growing up in, in Brazil as a, as, a black, as a black child, as a black wow. girl. Thank you. And, and, really, and really quick, uh, Kati. I just got a history lesson, man. That was a history oh, lesson. Yeah. I yeah. Just, oh, yeah. Look, we don't, I told you, we don't play. We don't, <laughs> we don't play. But uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Tramel, Juliana, uh, it's interesting now because I do play capoeira. Like, I play capoeira. Oh, you do? Oh, my I God. I play capoeira. I was introduced from my roommate in college. What's up, Jimmy? Peace. Um, but now I play with a capoeira group here in New York. And uh, exact, everything you said, but I did not know the part that, adults in brazil would like say don't look at it that is that's bad it's horrible like i know the political history of it the quilombos uh i know that it was used as an act of resistance uh i know that um you have the the, the different styles he's and Ang angolera i play angolera because because they because they, they say that a lot of the africans are, are african brothers and sisters enslaved it came uh that they that they forced over there are from mozambique and angola um that's right mm -hmm. in, in those parts those countries those countries in africa but no, you just, you just gave us a huge history. <laughs> oh, it's so much. Yeah. And, and, it's, and, and so in 1930, that was the, that was the year that the Miss Education of the Negro was being published. Mm -hmm. And Gilberto oh, Freddy published uh, that book. And he never mentioned racial democracy, but he described this, this new Brazil. Uh, because we were emancipated in 1888. So 1930 is a few years after that, a few decades yeah. after that. So, so Gilberto Freddy gave a really um, clear picture of what Brazil would become in the future if we embrace miscegenation, if we make the darker people lighter. So he was basically celebrating this new identity. And uh, during that time, Brazil even facilitated the migration of poor Europeans to Brazil to help expedite the whole, you know, whitening of the population. Mm -hmm. So that's why today, you know, people are asking me, because, you know, I've been, you know, uh, doing social distance since March. I do everything online. But when George Floyd was killed, I broke that social distance. I could not stay in the house. I put my mask on and I went to the street mm -hmm. and, I, I, and I put on Facebook. So Brazilians would see how we handle these types of things here. Just mm -hmm. yesterday, you know, the I started to circulate a video of the a police officer putting the feet on the neck of a black woman in Brazil. And, mm -hmm. and they'll ask me, what kind of water do y'all drink there? Because we wouldn't go to the streets and do that. <laughs> and my answer yeah. to them is, number one, if I say, let's go downtown Savannah to protest, I don't, I don't have a question who would go with me. I know that if it's safe, you two will go with me and protest. If you don't want to go downtown Savannah, you find another way to protest. But there is a, a sense of who is black and who should, who should, you know, in most cases, fight for race, racial discrimination in the U.S. In Brazil, coyote, coyote, right? You would, you could say that you are from different race. My mom is actually your complexion. When I was five years old, I used to tell my mom, I want to be l white like you. Now, tap into the mindset of a five-year-old saying that to a mom that has your complexion. My dad was my complexion, maybe Kyle's complexion. That's how deep colorism is in Brazil. You and I could be in two different races. Two different races. So when you say, who's going downtown to protest? We don't know who's going to go. Because if you can, and by the way, the census, I'm waiting to see the 2021. They just postponed to next year. Okay. But the census of 20 and 2010, both census had an open ended question for ethnicity. So Brazil has over 100 ethnicities, as they say, for wow. colorism, because they allow people to call themselves whatever they want to call themselves. So you end up having pinkish, brownish, 
Coco. Those are names that people throw on the stances. When I do my research, I actually have to, and I can show in a, in a different podcast, I can show my, the, the, I have a book chapter, and I have to call our people and make them pick. You know, we can <laughs> match them because I couldn't ask who's black because I wouldn't know, because depending on who is asking, you can say that 30% of Brazilian is black, 30%. But 65% is black if you come and join join the group. Or maybe somebody a little lighter than you join the group. We are wow. 65%. But if it's just me and Kyle, yeah, we thought a percent. Dark skin. But if you want to join us, 65%. And I had to use this these little dolls on my on my on my book chapters in my research so I understand you know, how people see themselves before I can assume that I'm I'm researching people of color in Brazil. No, I don't know where to go with this, Cal. Not me for you. Um yeah. well, okay, 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 okay. Um, and then and then you see countries that took advantage of the crazy ideologies in Brazil and then you hear people say things like let's go to Brazil because you find you know the darker yeah. skin with the blue eye you know or the darker yeah. skin with the curly hair but this is all part of the systemic racism you know that they exist in Brazil Jesus mm-hmm. okay so oh my god all right yeah. so I speaking as a voice for inner city youth how did you okay so I'm I'm, I'm trying to understand because I have a two-part question to this. So you're, you were able to deprogram the systemic racism that they were doing in Brazil by educating yourself. Is that correct? That education gave you an opportunity to come here to the States to be informed on what blackness is, its culture, its richness, its contribution. What advice would you give to a young person in Brazil that's going through that program who hasn't had that opportunity or that blessing to get that education, get whatever their home environment was, be it, be it whatever the opportunity lacks there were, what advice would you give a young person there that's under that indoctrination to free themselves mentally from the systemic racism in Brazil? Mm-hmm. Well, things are changing in Brazil now. You Facebook and you know, social media are giving us a platform. So now you can go on Facebook and see different scholars, you know, speaking in Portuguese and talking about race. Uh, but what I tell people is, while I was in Brazil, I was not aware. I was what I call Brasiliada is a term that I'm coining to mean that I knew how to perform well in a Brazilian culture. And how to, it's, 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 it's when we, in, in America, it's when we, we know we like, but we do everything right, so we won't be, so we won't suffer, is when you see a, camp, uh, uh, a police officer and you do everything, yes, sir, yes, police officer, how can I help my hands? Okay, officer, I'm going to point. So I, I had that in me, that made me successful in Brazil as a student, was because I know how to behave. But I was never aware. The education I received in Brazil, it was, you, you educated to know this, it was totally anti Paulo Freire. That's why he actually had to leave. You know, the, the pedagogues of the oppressed, you know, yes. so I knew well, the Freire, material yeah. well. Exactly. Yeah. I knew the material. Yeah. I was smart. I was intelligent, but I was not conscious. I was not being educated. I was being trained. I was being do- indoctrinated, not not educated. Came into the U.S., I had the education, but I also have living experiences. So what I tell to younger people who might be in Brazil, uh, they they have to be in a group where we can talk about these things, to have authentic conversations about race relations. It's nearly impossible to achieve that level just by reading a book because the books are not liberated. We still have to talk about, you know, um, curriculum and, the, and how curriculum is not liberated, li- liberated yet. Thank you. That, that ties into so much to what's going on here in the states. Like that's a that's a that is an association of what's going on in Brazil, what's going on in the state. When you mentioned the book Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire, family, definitely go check that book out. I have it in my library. 
Um, yeah. Right. Like you said, the, 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 the content of what we teach our children, especially like we talk about in Brazil, again, it is, it is in reference of favoring the system. Fall in place, fall in line, do what we tell you to do, and everything will be cool. But once exactly. you step out of that paradigm, once you step out of that training, that miseducation, then you're a problem. Because now you see it for really what it is and how exploitative and how oppressive it is to most of the people there. So that, 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 was, a, wow, that was a great question, Kade, because I mean, this is that. And we, right, and just recently I got the copies of the curriculum, K-12 curriculum uh, from five states in Brazil. I'm going to one by one to analyze to see, you know, how they are treating people of color when they mention African people. Do mm -hmm. they mention the same way they mentioned when I was in school? It's almost like they, they tell the, the, the history as if they're celebrating, they celebrate the acts of the oppressors and slave masters, and they mm -hmm. never talk about African people as, 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 as the people with a culture before slavery. We existed before slavery. Yes. And so I'm troubled because I never learned about my history. I was going about my history to the lenses of the oppressor, and I learned how to be embarrassed to the point that when I, one of the first things I noticed when I got here was that African Americans would say, when we were slaves or enslaved Africans, yeah. in Brazil, the history was taught they, they, third person, as if that experience was happening to somebody else. But somehow we were embarrassed. It's like in a class, I remember being in a classroom and I would almost like go under the desk. Every time they talk about slaves, it was just, oh my gosh, you know, I look like them, but they're not me. So I was confused. Wow. You know? So yeah, they wow. and slaves. So they post wow. colonial Brazil, you know, it was so rude, it was so cruel to the African people. And that's a kind of a liberation that we need. I'm not by no means praising Jim, Jim, Jim Crow, but what it did though, it did create a coherent group. You know, you'll learn how to sit together, you know, through music, through church, and through black, the black, the HBCUs, you learn how to just coexist together and you'll learn how to create a coherent identity. Even in the absence of books, you had oral tradition. The mm -hmm. oral tradition in the black families were strong. At least I was, I was introduced to a lot of black families with a very strong sense of oral tradition, passing down from grandma to, you know, pass down generations. In Brazil, mm -hmm. we didn't have Jim Crow. So just like, oh, okay, we're just like a frog, you know, in, a, in, a, in, the, in water and the water is getting heated slowly and then you don't realize the water is getting heated and then you just point that. Mm -hmm. Now we, that's what we have today. Mm -hmm. That's what we have today. It's a whole generation of African people in Brazil, the largest population of Africans outside of Africa, all brain, brainwashed by white supremacy. Wow. Whew. Okay. Um, Dr. Dr. Juliana, um, since your since arriving here in the States, HBCU, what, Holla. Holla. what would you say were your initial successes? Like what 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 did you achieve at? Because I, I'm trying to imagine here you're coming from Brazil with this indoctrination, not knowing mm -hmm. what's going on. You're being uh, I wouldn't say inundated, but you're being presented with this new information of information that relates to you and your culture particularly. How were you able to adjust to the extent where you were able to achieve some modicum level of success, having gone through that deprogramming, as it were, here in the United States. I don't know if you want to, was that? Right, <laughs> definitely. Well, the, the, the good part was that I, I was brought, I, I came here to go to attend a HBCU. So, and so I was super focused on my academics. So because of, and because I was focused, the U.S. celebrates, Intel, you know, my kids. So I was getting all kinds of opportunities just because I was so focused on my education. 
I, I mean, I used to study Friday night, Saturday night. You know, my friends would go out and party, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, yeah, I'm not going because I was born, you know, in a very traditional Christian family. I was mm -hmm. not impressed by, you know, the whole club experiences and going out. So I was on my books, and so my GPA was really, really high. So the world, I mean, the the university will put gold on my foot. I mean, everything. I got everything in my undergrad just because I was just straight A student, you know. And so that was a good thing. It was challenging because when I got here, I was overwhelmed, you know, with all the new information. My self esteem started to be changed dramatically because now I am a, a black woman in the U.S. and they see black women differently. So I was dealing with that. You know, I remember going to one day I went to this talent show and there was like a, this brother reciting a uh, Maya Angelou poem to black women. I was like, what is he doing? You know, what is wrong with him? You know, cause, and he was so full of passion. I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with him. So I was like, what is he doing? But, you know, so we it took me a minute to understand that, that, that black women were somehow appreciate it and love, you know, so that for me, it was a process to accept. Um, but the most challenging thing was it came to a point that I realized that I was on my HBCU campus. So I share the same race, but a different ethnicity. And that was the most challenging thing. Ooh. Because when you share a race, you know, we look alike, you know, but when ethnicity is different, ethnicity deals more with the cultural background, your, your your way of living, your you know your language, how you perceive things, and I was totally different. I was I was just different, you know. And some people will look at me and say, "You behave like a white woman," you know. Uh, you speak like a white woman, you know. So that, and that was being Brazilian, you know, being I mean, you know, eating with eating pizza with a fork and a knife, you know. I would never eat you know, in college with my hands, you know, touching food, wow. it's something that you just don't do, you know, you eat with a, you know, so I was in a cafeteria, very, you know, formal, <laughs> say things differently, you know, so I had a totally yeah. different culture and they say, you're not black, so I'm black, you're not black, I'm black, no, you're not black. And so understanding that I share the same race, but right. a business initially was totally, it was new. You know, and today I, I, I do better now. You know, I, I'm more comfortable in my skin. But at first, I would be, I, was, I used to be very upset, you know, when they would say things like, you're not, you know, you're not from here. So, you know, this is home now. No, you're not, you know. So that was a little different uh, at first. But now I'm more, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm more vocal yeah. and, and uh, more, you know, feel more yeah. at home. So when people say stuff, I just educate them, you know, but before I used, used to be really hard on me to, because at that point I became homeless. Going back to Brazil, I already mm -hmm. had acquired mm. behaviors that was American, you know, they would say I'm Americanized, but then being yeah. here, I'm, you're not really American. American. You, you know, so I was like, okay. Then I went to, F, I went to uh, Zimbabwe. Mm, nice. And then when I went to Zimbabwe, you know, it was home. Oh my gosh, I'm at home. This is home. The after home, the home, home, home. But by then came a point that I was not really, it was not really, really home. I became homesick. So that's when I realized I see myself through the lens of three countries. And I saw myself as the other. Uh, the other was created. There was not really, I lost, all, I, I was not all the way Brazilian. I will never be all the way American. And I'm not all the way African. I'm just here in the middle of this triangle, trying to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, who I am. And so, you know, now is the, I'm comfortable in that scheme today, but that was a process, you know, being so young, you know, being almost by myself, trying to figure all these things, you know, out. That's amazing, man. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. And, and, and Julia, that speaks to, uh, I'm sure you had these conversations before with uh, your other professors and students and other colleagues. Like when we talk about this expansiveness of blackness, like coming out of the, uh, the Harlem Renaissance, when we talk about the, the different dimensions, Langston Hughes, like you said, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, James Weldon Johnson, um, who else? Uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, you know, we wear the mask, you know, going back further back. 
like that expansiveness of what it means to be black, what it means to be African in the in the diaspora, you know. And it's like I didn't know about the diaspora until I got to Fisk, and it was like well, diaspora. What's that? It's like yeah. oh, like where well, the African is all over the world. It's like where we represent, like say, Afro Brazilian, African American, you know. Like if you if you're in Zimbabwe, African Zimbabwean, you know. It's like you know, so because because people yeah. think like just because Africa is Africa, you think you automatically like oh, that's home. I'll just tap in and everything's it cool. Is. Like you said, it's those customs and traditions and certain mm -hmm. ways of living, those habits that are different. And it's, and it's crazy because you're coming from a place that's hot, heavily African, heavily African influenced, but yet it is denied politically and socially. So therefore, exactly. you sort of out of water. And then you come to America and you're like, oh, I'm black. And they're like, no, nah, ain't, you ain't black. <laughs> it's like, what? What's she talking about? Yeah, like, you know, right. Not, exactly. Not like, what? Like, and it's it's yeah it's just uh it's 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 always intriguing but it's all always sometimes frustrating at the same time mm -hmm. exactly it is and and you mentioned fisk you know my whole experience was i, I didn't go to fisk but every time i was on in nashville i was on fisk campus and just going to mm -hmm. events or tennessee state you know i mean it, it literally took a whole village to help me grow uh, as an Afro scholar, as an Afro Brazilian, you know, I mean, I was in Mississippi, but if I wasn't in Nashville, I was on Fifth Campus. It's it just, and then I was at Howard, so just, it, it really yeah, took a village, you know, to really, you know, uh, help me, help me come out of myself and be able to see Brazil, you know, differently. Indeed. Indeed, and I and I think that's the I think that's one of the powers and one of the benefits of community that I think a lot of us have, we talk about it like Kaidi mentioned earlier we have neighborhoods but not communities anymore and it does we we are we are one we are self but that comes out of the community as a whole because we're still exactly. connected exactly and it's like people don't exactly. realize that the whole is what shapes you like even though you're your own person but it is that collective that shapes you and what in in and, and guides you in the sense of how you see the world how you, how you perceive yourself how you perceive the world and how that world changes, you know, or, or can change. So, no, that's exactly, a great exactly. And the book chapter that I published uh, two years ago, I actually talk about how systemic racism in Brazil is sustained by the community. You know, so you look at a community in Brazil at who replicates the oppressor's message. So you don't, you don't, you don't need a white person to pick on you, uh, to call you the N word. Even if it's playing with humor, we do among mm -hmm. ourselves, and that's that. But the, we're doing it in a negative way. It's different the way it's done here. But but what you mentioned was the importance of community to build a race, right? To build uh, people. In Brazil, the same community was doing the opposite, and that's one of the main uh, differences that I see between Brazil and the U.S. You know, is why is how there was a second level of oppression that was being practiced in Brazil to keep us in that level of, uh, of uh, oppression. So, mm -hmm. but because Brazilians were using humor to, uh, to discriminate people of color, so the hair texture, because it was, doing, doing, was done with humor, it was not perceived as racism. So you're still mm -hmm. degrading the black men, you're still degrading black women, you're still putting black people in that place you ugly, you're not worth it by just singing and playing. I'm just playing, but they didn't realize how that was contaminating the whole community. Now, I didn't see that here, even though there is a whole controversy of the N word, you know, when can, who can say it, who cannot say it. There was right. still a brotherhood, you know, there was still, to me, you know, a sense of building one another, even though that can be challenged. But there yeah. was still a lot of sense of, uh, there was still music, you know, black and proud. There was still a lot of things in the culture, in the neighborhood, at home, in the church, in school, that would uplift people of color. We miss mm -hmm. that in Brazil. What we mm -hmm. had in the community, what we had in school, what we had at home was a sense of shame. And my, in my family, for example, my parents, all they could tell me is, be the best you can be, that's your way out. That was the only message they could fight at that time was be the best you can be. All the rhetoric of, you know, you beautiful, you, you know, we as people, all the stories in history were absent from the black home in Brazil. Mm. And that was present here. That was present here. 
But that was all we had. My father always, always used to tell me before he passed, you know, you cannot be good, you can be the best. And that stuck with me. And that's what led me to be where I am today. I always knew I had to be the best in everything I did. And I mm-hmm. tell people, I'm not competing with you because a lot of people took that the wrong way. They think I'm competing with them. They say, listen, I'm not competing with you. I'm just looking at myself. If I'm not the best, I don't have a chance. I'm mm-hmm. dark. I'm here now, I'm a foreigner. No, I had to be the best. That's why, you know, I went for a PhD because I need, I need to stand a chance. Mm. And being the best I could be, it was my chance. I'm not competing with you, do you. But I had to a lot of times remind people that I was just competing with myself. Somehow I had this driving me to keep pushing and to keep unveiling this myth that was put upon me. And being in the US made me more curious to understand why, you know, what, what was that, that I experienced in Brazil that nobody talked about? Mm-hmm. Racism mm-hmm. is the elephant in the room. Everybody mm-hmm. sees it, but nobody talks about it. As a matter of fact, when I used to go back to Brazil, they used to tell me that I was racist. And I would say, why am I racist? Because you talk about race too much. <laughs> that's that projectionism, Kyle. That's that that's yeah. projectionism, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, but that's Brazil. That's Brazil for you. You know, this, this yeah. giant in South America. You know, you see Pele, everybody knows Pele. Even, you know, and then if you're successful in black, you will have to marry a white woman. We know that's the, that's, that's just, that's wow. just what black men should do. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the, the guideline, the, the, uh, the hidden guideline for yeah, the criteria, people yeah. color, the criteria. And Pele is, a, is an example. He was one of the most successful or well-known, I would say, you know, person of color in Brazil over time, over history. And he married a white a European woman with blue eye, you know, wow. and that's what they do. Right. You know, right. And I think, and I, and I want to interject too on that, uh, Dr. Tramiel Juliana. Um, a lot of people feel like, well, you know, I can't control who I love. And, and that could be true. You know, that's debatable. Mm-hmm. But I think what people need to realize is that, the, the like you said, the common guidelines and criteria is that because of the indoctrination of, you know, being not of African, and if you are, that's looked down upon, that you automatically, your psychosis is going towards what is beauty, and that beauty right. has a face exactly. and a picture, and exactly. it tends to be someone of European Caucasian, not someone of your own skin tone. Again, you can love who you love, I'm not saying that, but I think a lot of times exactly. people in conversation think like, oh, well, you know, you can control who you love. I'm not saying that. I think what people are trying to say is that the idea of someone outside of yourself being the premier beauty, that's a problem. Exactly. It's not to say that you don't, you don't love other people, but if you don't love yourself despite other people, then what are we talking about here? You know? Yeah, and I remember growing up, hate, you know, hate is the voice, exactly, they, they, sometimes they'll like you, but they will take you home, you know, they will take you seriously. So we see a lot of, there are a lot of people now discussing the, the, um, uh, the love life of black women in Brazil because that is something that really happened with black women when they are not, they don't, uh, they are not perceived as the ideal, you know, um, you know, they're, they're the, the, the keeper, right? As you say here, right? Oh, you, you, she's a keeper, you know? And yeah. so, you know, being a keeper. So a lot of black girls, they deal with that. Sometimes they are not, they are not, they, they're not taking home because the parents will expect a lighter com- complexion, you know, to mm. be a part of the family, especially if it's a white family. Uh, mm. So there is a lot of things, a lot of experiences in Brazil that we don't talk about, that we never study. You know, we feel those things. Now, I'm, I've, I'm, I, when I open and talk about these things, sometimes I hear myself as being the first person to talk about those things. You know, now with social media, I've been able to be integrated with a very small population of other Black Brazilians who are talking about those things, mm-hmm. you know, but, but growing up, if you just know that, you know, you're dark, you might not have a boyfriend, you know, because wow. you're just dark, you know, your parents didn't mix, you didn't mix, so you're in a bad shape because you're, you're too dark, you know, and so, and there was the kind of things that, the children grow up with, with, used to grow up with. And then that was also translated to mass media. 
uh, that was also translated yes. to the literature. You know, uh, when blacks were portrayed in literature, in poems, in books, they were still you know, we still we still were stereotyped. The same in soap operas, the same in film. Um, so, and even now, I think the most recent studies show that only ten percent of the Brazilian television is black. Ten percent wow. on TV. Ten percent on TV. But 65% in the population, I don't get it. And, wow. and, and from the 10%, remember, most of it is with stereotypes. It's the, it's the sexual, the hypersexual myth that, that follow, you know, uh, follows black men and black women. It's still, mm -hmm. you know, it's being the teeth or being, or always playing a negative role you know, mm -hmm. on the, in the media. So there's still stereotypes going on there in the 10%. So we have, we have, we have a way wow. to go. We have a way to go. You know, when you had BTs, we still don't, we still don't have a, a black network in Brazil. You have a historic black colleges. Mm -hmm. We only have one in Sao Paulo, Zumbi dos Palmares, just one, you know. Wow, one. And this is when 60% is black. <sighs> And, and and Dr. Julian, like how mm -hmm. is the ten percent compared? And do you know the numbers here in America? Like as far as per population, uh, is ten percent in Brazil? Like do you know the numbers here in in, in America? Like how much we represent on like media? The percentage? Yes. Oh, in the you know media, that? um, it's much higher. I don't have the most recent numbers, mm -hmm. but what we do see in the U.S is what we call representation. You know, the, I think affirmative action has mm -hmm. served America well, the US mm -hmm. well. You know, so in every major network, you see at least two African-Americans. Uh, when you see film, you still see African-Americans uh, in film. Mm -hmm. you, see, you still see, Af basically, in, 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 even though with Donald Trump, even though Congress is um, Senate, you know, you saw some of the people that he nominated were all white we still elected people of color. Mm -hmm. We don't see that in Brazil. Even mm -hmm. if we, among elected officials, we still celebrate the mayor in Atlanta, the mayor of Chicago, the mayor of DC, and the mayor of Savannah. You know, we still see a black elected officials. We don't see elected officials in Brazil. That's mm -hmm. the extent of the, Benedito da Silva is one. And there are some others, but um, what we see in the US is more representation you know, um, of people of color in, in, in many parts of, of society, we don't see that in Brazil. I never saw a black PhD until I became one. Mm. Mm. Wow. I got a PhD in 2006, 10 years later after I came here, I was getting owning a PhD. I was the first one, I had to look at the mirror and say, hey, congratulations. Oh, that's awesome. That's wow. cool. That's what Sean talked about when we spoke with him a few months ago when he got his PhD, right? Yes, Sean. Yeah, Emmanuel Peter. Yeah, definitely check that episode out, family. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, he talked about it. And he's from the Caribbean. Uh, his family's from the Caribbean. And he, yeah, and uh, he talked about that as well. He got his degree, his, his PhD from Columbia. And was it a, uh, was it a uh, mechanic? Was it mechanical engineering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mechanical That's engineering. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Dr. Yeah, so. Dr. Julian, with this wealth of not only of the experience that you've had from being indoctrinated to breaking free from indoctrination uh, to achieving the accolades that you've achieved based on your education which freed you. What type of impact did you have uh, with regards to research and communications and culture? And how, how was that, how have you seen that affect those that you teach? Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the the greatest joy of this entire process has been uh, being a, an active participant of the academic uh, scholarly community um, because uh, what I did was I decided to write do do research to show how racism impacts my life and the lives of those that look like me. So I spent a lot of time doing research and publishing, even though my research is not popular knowledge because now when, it, when it's in journal, nobody reads journals, right? Mm -hmm. 
So I, right. I, am a lot, I yeah, I speak, but my hope is that I'm documenting. Hopefully, the philosophy today becomes common sense tomorrow, and that's how it happens, right? You know, you mm -hmm. write those books. Nobody reads your books. Nobody reads your research. But then, 20 years later, they dig it and they find it. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I speak. I spend a lot of time speaking. You know, we're seeing that scholarly community, which is very, it, it's still an elite, you know, nobody really, it doesn't impact, you know, the broader society. We, and we talk about the problem, you know, you have all these PhDs, all these scholars doing research, but it doesn't go down to the community. It's easier for a vaccine research to penetrate the community than uh, an ideology on race relations. I mean, it, it's not that simple. You know, we, we have a few books in there. But there are a lot of people talking about race, but they see within the universities, right? Mm -hmm. The boundaries of the university system. Mm -hmm. So, but that's why I am, because I realized that my experiences were being perceived as crazy. You know, when I complained to adults that I was being bullied, they say, oh, just be stronger. Oh, it won't hurt you. You know, so now what I do is I spend time through science I spend, I spend time trying to understand how racism works so people can take me seriously. Mm -hmm. And so I had to totally take myself out of it because as a scientist, I cannot use my personal experience because that's bias. So I take yeah. myself out of it and I'm trying to document and I'm trying to prove how systemic racism works in Brazil. So that's one of the things that I see as a benefit. Because I am on a college campus, I try to encourage my students most of them want to be on TV and be, you know, producers and do make yeah. films and stuff. But I also try to encourage some of them to go and get a PhD because that's where we become literate. We need to start publishing our experiences. We collectively, we still enjoy our oral traditions. It's part of who we are. But because we live in a literate world, we have to document our experiences. We have to rewrite the histories the, the way through our lenses, you know. And and when you go get a graduate degree, a PhD, that's all you do. You are trained to look at look back and rewrite the histories. But if you don't invest in black PhDs or people who take interest in our cause, we won't be able to document those things. Exactly. We still talk in 2000. We're still talking about the curriculum being uh, not 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 doing, not not teaching black history. Exactly. We're still 20, teaching about 2020. 2020. We're in 20 years into the new millennium, and it's, it's right. And it's still, it, it, exactly. You it's know, like 1920, 1920, 2020. We still deal with the same. Exactly. So I believe that literacy, scholarship can make a difference. So I understand not everybody can get a PhD. It's not for everybody because you know you gotta spend be willing to spend a lot of time by yourself writing, you know, volumes of words. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to continue to document our experiences, not just as experiences, but also as science. You know, for so many years African American women, Brazilian women, Afro Afro Brazilian were using perms. And there was nobody scientifically studying the impact of perms on the health of people, of women of color. Mm. See, mm. It, it's like, it takes, it takes, it takes will to study. Like what I learned being a PhD is that there is a world of unknown. We don't know a lot of things. How do we know? Personal choice. You choose what the next question you are going to answer. So mm. my questions are always about my people. I want to ask questions about my people. Questions that nobody else could, were, were able, even like the question you asked about the, the portrayal of Blacks in the American TV, I had to go back and ask more questions about that. How that has changed from last year? Is with questions that we will create a literate culture for our people. And it takes will. You have to be willing to go and find the answers for those questions. And education, a PhD, in my, I make a case for PhD because that's the space where you are able, it's the, only, it's the only sphere that you are able to disagree with everything you have ever read 
and we write everything fresh. Everything else, college experience, in most cases, you are just memorizing what is on the book. Sometimes I use PR books written by my fellow colleagues, you know, UJ, I'm not looking down, but when I teach PR, to my black students, I had to tell them we were doing PR in slavery, but because it was formalized by, it was formalized in the 19, you know, early 1900s, they are calling, they did it. So why? Because we are not publishing. We are not writing. You know, so that's why I make a case for PhD. It's not just to put letters behind your name. It's because that's the only sphere you can really challenge, you know, knowledge. You challenge right. not what well, we think we know. You can turn that into we know something new. No, we know better. We know better. Right. You go to that space of knowing better, and it has to be through science. Cannot be through experience because you won't take me seriously if I tell you my story. All right, so subjective. Fine, I'll, yeah. Exactly. It has to be objective. It has to be yeah. empirical. You have yeah. to prove in a way that and other people data. can see it from that from where they are. You have to believe this is green. I have to prove it to you that this is green. This is green, and I have to prove it to you that's empirical. It's when you can see green and I can see green, right? That becomes mm -hmm. empirical. So I had to come up and, and prove that science, that racism, can be proved through science. So you can so they can take it seriously. And that's yeah. what I'm trying to do in Brazil. Ooh, salute. <laughs> yeah. and, and like seriously hand on the heart salute because that is necessary and that is important work yeah. uh, to break down those structural systemic racist white supremacist systems people don't understand that it's not just about getting in the street with guns you also can get it through the books and to the knowledge because this is what they use to justify their oppression they're using the exactly. literature and the history to just fight oppression. So you're saying, look, I'm gonna meet you at, okay, you gonna go to that book? Well, I'm gonna challenge that book and I'm gonna rewrite that book. So when you go back to the exactly. book, it has changed. It has changed. Yeah. So you can no longer use yeah. that yeah. ideology yeah. and that rule on us anymore. You can try. Exactly. But I've already proven it to be false and illegitimate. So exactly. That is exactly. I mean, and, yo, and, and even, I wasn't, you know, and when you look at how history is taught to our kids, they always, they almost like um, just fight slavery throughout the, the way the history is taught, the way they break down the revolutions and, you know, it's almost like they would basically celebrate in their behavior. Mm -hmm. We had to do better, to, we had to teach history better to our kids. And, 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 and in America, in the U.S., we, we have the black, the black families are, for the most part, I mean, I would say so, are um, passing the histories down, but there are cultures like Brazil where we don't have that. So it's even more dangerous. All you have is this misleading black history, uh, misleading history being taught with the absence of black history being taught. It's, not, it's as if we were born in slavery, we were born in slavery, what do we know about pre-slavery? What is right. being taught in schools? Where we came from? Right. Portuguese is not my language. I, what language did I speak? Right. Portuguese, even Angola speak Portuguese and Mozambique. That language is not our language. They they pass the language to us. Yeah, it's the colonizer's language. Yeah. The colonizer's language, exactly. English, yeah. you know, so you, you look at the African continent, you know, some of them speak English, then Portuguese. That, that language was not native of the African continent. And that's not being taught, you know. And let me say something to you. And because I'm in communications, I pay very close attention to linguistics. The vocabulary does not benefit our struggle. We, my, what I, what, what I put in one of my papers, one of my first papers, in my PhD program. I was trying to make a case. I was reading that paper the other day. You know, I was, I was such, I was such a baby back then. But I was mm. trying to claim that the Portuguese language would never liberate black Brazilian because the language does not have words that will help us evolve. Ooh. For example, Ooh. legacy, legado, that word, I never heard of that word before until mm -hmm. I came here. 
And the legacy, 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 my legacy. What are you talking about? What right. are you <laughs> like Jay-Z, legacy, legacy, legacy. <laughs> yeah, I could not understand the meaning of legacy. I could not comprehend. It took months for me to comprehend what right. legacy meant because that word was not in the Brazilian vocabulary. Wow. Uh, Legado, yeah. to, you know, so I said legado. Now I, I hear a few people saying that's so okay, legado, but it's not a common word, word in a Brazilian dictionary. Wow. And many other words, you know, heritage, we don't use ancestors, we don't use those words in a Brazilian uh, dictionary. Wow. See, so. And, oof, 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 you just, hold on, hold on, Dr. Trump, hold on, Dr. Trump. <laughs> you just, you just, <laughs> You gotta have the language. You gotta have language. Language is just what brings us to a sense. You cannot have sense without language. What Got is it. this? This is a pen. We saying? agree. This is a pen. We come to the senses because we agree with the meaning in language, and because we don't, we, we can manipulate language. And that's one thing that I think it was so different in the U.S. It was because linguistically, I think African Americans were able to have. So many that they understood and nobody else did. Mm, yes. And this is what yeah, I talk whatever. about with my students. I'll talk about the exactly. students. The the language, the the and I and I challenge this. And I'm a, and I'm an English teacher, family, y'all. I'm an English teacher. I challenged the English language because I said they when they said you're not speaking proper English. Now again, we understand that there are certain ways to speak the English dialect properly. I get that, I understand. But I tell my students that your language is not lesser than, it is just different. When you exactly. say what's good, what's what, what, uh, uh, smell me, feel me, that is a language of you and your peers. As long as you all understand each other, it is valid. You, it exactly. empowers you. And it's, and it's to say exactly. that it's say that you use that in your uh, uh, social dynamic. There's another social dynamic. When you come to school, you use that in your social dynamic. So the fact that you're able to communicate with each other and understand each other, there is power and there is a, a community in that. I'm sorry. To that, exactly. I want to have, uh, to that point, I want to bring up, this is what the big fight was with regards to uh, what they call it, um, uh, Ebonics years ago. That was their whole fight. So, but also, dude, I have to tell you, we're at the top of the hour. We're 10 minutes past. Can we go? Can we go? Is that, <laughs> uh, not even at least five minutes, 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay. 15, we'll give you an extra 15 minutes and then we'll close out. Okay, yes. thanks, Ms. Yulia. Please continue. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, so here uh, in Georgia, we have the Gula Gechi culture here. Mm, and they yes. still have a lot of the language, you know, which they're trying to preserve as much as possible. Yes, um, and, and we, it was we do teach our students how to code switch sometimes. You had to learn how to code switch. But one thing that was really interesting when I got here was that as part of that training, uh, an older uh, African American man, he, he was trying to prove to me that he could tell who was behind him if he was a black person or a white person. I said, oh, no, you cannot. I can't. I could not believe him. I could not believe. So he did a test, you know, he, you know, he, he basically, he was basically testing me with the several people to show, even without him seeing who the person was, he was telling me he's black, he's white. So that language um, distinction was never present in Brazil. You cannot tell who is black and white by, on the phone. You can, you can pick up an accent as far as region, right? She's from North, Northern Brazil. Or, she, or he's from, you know, southern Brazil, but you cannot pick up the accent because of uh, uh, ethnicity, because of the cultural element, because so, it's the same, you know, they have, no, you can't, you can't, customer service, you can't, you don't know, you cannot know. But I, I see it as our disadvantage in Brazil, because again, coming from communication, language is language, you, you need language to create community. We have community because of language. What happens when you try to communicate with people who don't speak your language, mm. right? I mean, you mm. pick up the nonverbal, but communication is challenging. Without communication, you might go right, you go left. It's, it's, difficult, it's difficult to unite when you don't speak the same language. Yes. And I think the Portuguese language is strategically, you know, uh, did some harm 
to people, to Afro Brazilians, particularly post post uh, the post the post colonial Brazil. You know, we could not evolve because of the lack of language. Uh, and now the religion is different. It's almost like in the U.S., you kept the same religion by a different linguistical experience. In Brazil, it was a different religion with the same language, and that didn't work for us. They still call, you know, capoeira and all that or the devil, you know, and we still had to use the same language, which never helped us to evolve wow. and ascend as people. Wow. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, it's just interesting because, I, I, you know, I, I, again, I family, I played Capoeira. I mentioned that earlier. I've been playing it off and on for about 10 years now, off and on. I just now really started really get seriously into it um, about three years ago. And uh, one of the Grand Masters is here in New York, uh, uh, Grand Master ja, uh, uh, Zhao Granji, uh, Mestre, Mestre Zhao Granji, respect Zhao Granji. Um, he's from Brazilian, Afro-Brazilian. He's like 90 years old. Um, and he just, he just drops jewels on us, like just about like the, the practice of the art, where it comes from, the traditions of it. And, uh, you know, we play the instruments and, and Capoeira is all not just about the dance and the martial art, but it's about the instruments, it's about the community. It's, we, we get, we, we, communi we commune in a circle, you know, we dance, you know, it's a rhythm, it's a dance. Like, right, even though exactly. we it's a dance, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a communication. We talk about language and communicating. It's a body language of communication. So what I'm getting at is, in reference of one, some of the African uh, spiritualities I'm studying, they talk about how words can be medicine. And I remember I talked about this with you, Kaede. Like when we say certain words, like you said, certain words register in our in our in our genetics in our cultural epigenetic heritage. So it's like like you're saying, certain words don't exist in Portuguese. Certain words don't exist in maybe English or whatnot that don't translate well. But once you find out that word, it resonates. With, with, exactly. with the, you know, it resonates. And then going into what you mentioned earlier, because I, I, I want to kind of pinpoint this, when we talk about um, shows and communication and, and, and African-Americans, Black folk being represented on TV and how PhDs can serve a purpose, family, I don't know if you all know this, but one of our favorite uh, television shows, The Cosby Show, was um, was curated by Dr. Alvin Poussant who was a, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard. So when you look at the Cosby show, look at the credit, it says doctor, it says Alvin Poussaint, PhD. They would go to Alvin Poussaint to, to uh, get his opinion on certain dynamics of the characters in the Cosby show. So the Cosby show, they use that as entertainment, but they also use it to push positive and also very uh, multi-layered uh, ideas of what a, what a black family is like. And the and, and the positions and and the and the uh, roles in the black family. So, as far as a show that made uh, such a change or revelations in the way this country looked at black people, and it was a real effort to change certain kinds of stereotypes. How difficult was it and how did you and the Cosbys go about making sure that those changes happened or that you were consistent in terms of what was on the air? Well, I, I think, you know, we were basically, you know, we saw all the shows on television, that's my mama, what's happening, all those shows. We, so a Cosby knew he didn't want a show like that, didn't want clown buffoonish stereotyping type things, and he wanted it something that would 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 make uh, kind of um, be on a high ground and elevate and inspire and and eliminate certain kinds of stereotypes that people had about black people, um, but also to promote education and good things, and that he wanted the show to be story driven, not a bunch of one liners which is a major decision, because that's where I came in. He, one of my jobs was to make sure the plots and stuff was believable. And so if I saw someone writing a scene, and I under, after I read the scene, I saw the punchline, and I realized they had the punchline before they had the scene, <laughs> I might flag that. Does this all make sense? Because you're forcing this scene in there. And then he wanted me to... to kind of be his alter ego 
and to check on scripts for any stereotypes against anybody, but also any kind of put down humor, etc., etc., etc. And then he said he wanted the interactions to be psychologically believable, so that even though it was a sitcom, people could say, oh, this happens with my kid, that happens with my family, this came up with my family, and that the solutions or the way you worked it out would also be believable, even though there was humor. And I assume that be because this was not exactly the normal way television operates, that you ran into some resistance. Yes, from, was, from writers. And was it because they were more comfortable with the stereotypes they were used to? Well, first of all, they wouldn't admit that they had any stereotypes. But we would, we would you ask them a question. I would ask the question of them that nearly all of them were white writers except one who wrote an occasional script. And I could tell when the black writer wrote the script, too. The trouble with the white writers was not so much they were racist, it was that they didn't have the experience. They didn't know the context of what they were writing about. And then if you ask them, where did you learn about black families? They didn't have an answer for you because it wasn't from hanging with black people. It was from other stuff they had seen on TV. So, it was so if they start they writing about a black family, they want to go to, that's my mama and what's happening. And Jeff, that's what they were going to go to to see how they should write. And Bill knew that. And that was true. It wasn't because they knew a black family could write a black family. And so you, sometimes that was the biggest problem because... If you want in the black context, I mean, things that look simple now but were very important. I would get a script and one of the students would be talking about applying to colleges and they would have in Yale, Oberlin, Swarthmore, uh, uh, Princeton, and the University of California. And I would flag it. And I would say, put in Morehouse, take out Princeton, put in Morehouse, take out UCLA and put in Howard. Okay. One of the writers said, what's Morehouse? <laughs> they had never heard of Morehouse. So how can they put in Morehouse if they had never heard of Morehouse? As a historically black... It was like that, sometimes simple. We got in arguments about hair, you name it. We got in arguments about who the casting person cast it to be the dates for th the son, Theo. And I saw three or four dates and they were all light-skinned, straight-haired black women. And I said, Bill, who's casting these people? So they can't cast all light-skinned black women with straight hair to be his girlfriend. So now look what happened. This shows you how indoctrinated we are. Bill went to the casting director and said, I want you to get some dates for Theo and I want them to be pretty. <laughs> That's all he said. And the casting director said, oh, pretty, light skin, straight hair. As, as mirroring right. the white standards. Right, of and that's beauty. what happened. So when we told the casting director, I said, Bill, that he's got to bring in women, black women, all different colors and dark and, you know, afros and everything else. He did it. He wasn't, he was just going, and this is how institutional racism functioned. That casting director was doing what he thought was the pretty women as a society to find them. And wasn't, it wasn't broad enough to think there was some other kind of pretty. And that doc was pretty. So we talk about PD and how we can use that, that hits right in line with that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, we have to infuse you know from from science from good knowledge good knowledge you know we have to almost like keep infusing culture and when i say culture i mean music and art and uh lit the literacy the books you know mm -hmm. the history books and uh, media so and, and i think um and I, th I think we still have a lot of work to do i think we are not in the promised land yet i think we're getting there um, but there's so much to be done because we, I think both the U.S. and Brazil are still an oppressed uh, community, society, 
you know, yeah. and and into uh, into see that even now we are still struggling to have Black history taught in school with so much of that Black history taught in the in the in the Black church in the Black family, but not in school. And and maybe because there's no HBCU K to twelve, maybe we should start thinking about that. I mean, we yeah, have we urban should. school. We should. We have Doesn't Howard school. though? Doesn't Howard have like a baby Howard next to it or something like that? No, like, we don't. No. <laughs> no, we we go into the community, you know. But that's what you know. We so we have this urban school with with a high concentration of black students, but they still using the curriculum set by the state, yes. by the district. That system, that's systemic, because if you notice just how effective uh, they were with indoctrinating you in Brazil at a young age, I think I was sharing this with Cal as well, a child's mm -hmm. formative years is up to the age of six years old. That's where you develop your personality. So the education system that, that they have globally, to a large extent, until you graduate high school has already started that indoctrination process process that systematically and deliberately keeps out the true contributions that African Americans have made. So by the time you get exactly. to college and you get to an H S H B C U college that's focused on your culture, you've already been programmed. Exactly. It, exactly. Exactly. And, and I'm going to say something that might come and bite me later, but I'm going to say it in your way. Uh, be going to a private HBC, going to two private HBCUs and working for a state HBCU, that's, I see a difference in, in, mm. in, in, in how much voice I can have. I publish, I publish whatever I want to publish because they, they really don't micromanage my publication. You know, but um, in the I private see that the more there's hmm? in, the, in the private I, college, they don't, they don't, they don't. No, in the state, it's a, where I work now, they don't really, you know, screen my research. I can ask any question I want. Okay. Uh, but the culture on a public HBCU is different from a culture on a private HBCU. I saw more <laughs> radical, a uh, more of a radical approach, and let's talk about it more on private HBCUs mm -hmm. That's what I than I see. My baby, I, thought, I was talking to my students, they said, well, maybe because you, you work here, so we have more, I, we, we had to speak, we, have, we filter what we say more because we employees, we work for the state. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I was a student on, on a private HBCU, you know, as soon as you can basically say what you want to say. So I do see a little, um, silencing even with this whole george floyd you know my you know it took a minute before state schools would make a make a, a statement mm -hmm. but the private schools were faster mm -hmm. in making statements yeah you know? i love all my yeah. hbcus i love all yeah but it's still state yes. money. we're still using their money right we're still using their money so we had to be careful um yeah careful in that but howard howard is private and and i mean it was just being on howard campus it's like being on fifth campus it was just amazing i mean i could not believe until to, until this day i look back and i cannot believe i had the privilege to just be on an hbcu campus like howard and my undergrad rust college because i learned so much you know being mm -hmm. mississippi being up north was a, was very different you know um Experiencing the down south, you know, was really like we got to yeah. fight this way. Yeah, I was yeah. totally isolated from white people, Caucasian people in Mississippi. I don't recall even having a one white, I mean, off campus counterpart. Of course, I had some Caucasian, you know, on campus, but off campus yeah. was, was, I had a very limited access to Caucasian. That's how different Mississippi was. So yeah, going, to DC, I, <laughs> going to DC, how I had to tone down a little bit, and I had to remember and learn, you know, that that we had other uh, if, uh, people from different ethnicities fighting our struggle with us. You know, it was not just a black and white thing. You know, so I had to learn, you know, because I was just like I was like, you know, all. And I think DC taught me how to kind of understand, you know, another way, you know, to the race relations in the, in America, in the U.S., but all together, you know, I cannot stop saying how privileged I am 
to have been exposed to the historical black college. And I work for one, and I would not, I cannot see myself work for PWI. I work for one, and I just had to go back home. I had to go back home. Mm. Mm. I had to go back to our See, that's what I'm talking I about, my family. Students. I loved my students, my PWI, I really did. You know, but I just had to go back home. And I love all my students, you know, black, white. We do have a diversity plan. You know, we do believe that we, we do encourage diversity. We plan to have diversity. Diversity doesn't just happen. You know, you have to be intentional, um, especially because our HBCU still experience the stereotype of not being up to par. Mm -hmm. Even though right. our, my program, the program that I represent, there are only two programs in Georgia with ACEJ and C accreditation. That's the accredited council that uh, accredits journalism programs in the country and in the global, you know, global world, uh, in, in the world. And in Georgia, only two universities have ACEJ and C accreditation. It's Savannah State and UGA. Wow. UGA, University of Georgia, and Savannah State. Even in that, we still fight stereotypes are not being up to par with our program mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. so we do have to work a little harder to bring diversity you know to show that we are qualified to teach not only black students but just anybody who wants right. to be trained you know to to have a career in journalism so we do we had to work harder because we fight that stereotype uh you know against some other programs well-known programs around us who are not credited but we are you know, so, uh, it, it just, it just, it just, uh, it always is just an interesting dynamic when we're talking PWIs, which means public, uh, uh, public white institutions that, mm -hmm. oh, you teach at a pub PWI or you learn a PWI, oh, you can teach anywhere. But if you, but if you get taught at an HBCU, a historically black college university, oh, we have to check and make sure that you can teach with everyone. Exactly. Like, are you, exactly. Are you, get yeah. out of here with that nonsense. You know, it's like exactly, I, I, yeah. I, I, mm, mm. And I remember, <laughs> you know, even during that, it's it's funny because even when I used to meet people, they used to say, "So where did you go to school? Russ College? Oh, where Russ? Yeah, Mississippi. Okay." Uh, they say, "Oh yeah, but but because I was coming from Howard, I used to always talk about Howard before I talk about my graduate, my master's degree. Mm -hmm. I went to American University." You know, a predominantly white school in Washington D.C., well-known American U. So they'll say, "Where'd you graduate from?" To Howard. Oh, oh, you smart. Okay. What about your master's, American U? Oh, you really smart. And I, I heard that so many See? times. See? And so we do many it. Times where, you know, I, I I always forget to mention American just because you know it was right in the middle. I always right. go to my foundation, Russ College, you know, and then Howard, but they, when I say American, they say, oh, yeah, oh. you are really smart. I've heard that so many times. Yeah, we but do America that. has to validate, yes. We do that, you know, yes. and no offense to those people who go to Harvard, Yale, Cornell, Princeton, those are great schools, I'm not going to front, but they, but like I always try to remind myself, Howard, Fisk, Rust, Morehouse, exactly. Winston-Salem, FAMU. Uh, Prairie View A and M. Uh, what else you got? I uh, got Spelman. You got um, what else? I oh, got uh, uh, yeah. I mean just Dealer, Dealer University. Dealer, Mary, you know Dealer. Xavier. You, know. you know, like we rank Bennett, up there with these Bennett schools. Bell. Exactly, and these are strong foundation. I mean, you. It's one thing when you're indoctrinated to just know your discipline. But when you go to HBCUs, we come out with a calling in your discipline. And I think that makes a difference. Yes, because what I usually tell people, it's not just about getting a PhD. It's, 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 it's bringing marginalized voice to the center of the conversation. That's my biggest accomplishment. It's not the ladders behind my name. It's mm -hmm. being an active participant in bringing those marginalized voices that we don't talk about to the middle of the conversation. It's talking about the impact of PERM on the health of African American women. It's talking about this concept of, you know, we as people of color, we tolerate pain, and then we don't have the right pain management in the hospital because they think we're just this machine. Mm -hmm. See, who is studying that? Who is exploring the perceptions of doctors and nurses when they see 
black skin, brown skin, in laying those under the hospital bed. There are so many of us going through cancer and we're suffering pain because they still perceive us as machines. We, we can tolerate pain. We just tolerate pain. That's what you do. You don't need to, uh, you don't need medication to control your pain. That's what I mean by bringing to the center those marginalized voices. So much, so much, so much. We at, we at thirty. We got to close out. Yes, uh, Doctor Juliana, you power got messed up because now I'm going to be in a tropical state for the rest of the night. You know what you see tonight, man. Thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank, thank you. you. I know Kyle. Kyle's family will be so proud of me because I remember his mom. You know, she would teach me so much about you know the black body. You know, she used to pick on me a lot because I was really, really, really skinny <laughs> when I first came. I was like really skinny. She used to pick on me like you know, um, you know, just explaining about black body and 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 being black. And it was I'll tell when I tell you the village, the village really raised me. In the yes. USA, it took a yes. village. You know, visiting black houses and black homes, and just talking to people, and just walking on campus. It, it, it has been it has been a, a journey that I will do all over again if I had to. And we appreciate you so much. Yes, um, we do. My my hashtags on Instagram and Twitter is Balagoon Logic B A L O G U N L O G I C. You can reach me there. Um, on YouTube, Kaya Day Bentley regarding Christianity, uh, Candidate Advisor regarding career development and instruction relationships, and Perspective TV one to one uh, discussions just like this uh, to a large extent. That's how you can reach me. Uh, Cal, your handle? Yo, uh, man, I'm, I'm almost at a loss for words because, again, this is a. This I'm is surprised a, I was able to get that out, man, with everything else. Right. <laughs> no, <'cause, laughs> I mean, no, I mean like just to just to as a as a friend, as a as a as a fellow colleague in the educational field, I'm just proud to have you as a good friend of the family and close friend. Um yeah, family. My uh my my tags are uh D I X underscore K O L E uh on Instagram. You can also reach me on Twitter at K E Z seven seven three. That's K E A S Y seven seven three. You can also reach me here on YouTube, Mr. Kyle Dixon. Uh, Dr. Juliana Tremel, could you end up where, where people can find you, contact you online if they have any more questions? Because I'm sure they do. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter. I'm J M Tremel, J M T R A M M E L. That's my Twitter uh, uh, username. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. And 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 thank you again. Juliana for coming on our platform. You drop some, yeah. you, you drop some just some stuff that we that really gives us perspective on the global dynamic of how racism and white uh, superiority ideology plays out on a global scale. And uh, exactly. I, I appreciate you, your family, thank the you. work that you thank do, you. Students, and please continue, you. continue to do that work. And we'll, we will we'll definitely do. have you back on because yes, definitely. A lot with regards to Brazil, yes, thank you. I, I I can't thank say you. It. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Indeed. My Indeed. pleasure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah bro. Thank oh, oh. you. <laughs> you know the kind of language. Uh, obrigado. 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 De nada. De, de nada. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Woo. All right. So, <laughs> so on that note, family, we got to say on, on at the end of all our uh, performances, definitely check, like, subscribe, share this. Um, we will have this up probably again uh, if you missed this one. If not, please still share it. A lot of information dropped in here. Definitely more for the study, more for us to do. And then that no family, Grand Rise Collective Podcast, we are out. Peace. Peace. <laughs>